Thank you. It's great to be here tonight. And I love the fact that this organization, this event is co-hosted by a faith-based organization and by a scientific organization. And I am connected with both of them and both of them are very important to what I do. I'm going to be talking about my field of climate change. And in doing so, I'm going to be reflecting on what science can tell us and what science can't tell us. There's really a continuum, I believe, from things that science can tell us, for sure, to things where science can offer insight and information, but not the complete answer, to questions where really what's in our hearts matters more than what's in our heads when it comes to making decisions, when we're confronted with tough issues like climate change. So I'm going to walk through four key questions with you. And really, as we walk through, I'm going to be tracking my own personal journey as well. Because when you first start off in your life, as I did, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a family where my dad was not only a teacher in our local church, a Bible teacher, but he was also a science educator. So I grew up very much with the idea that, first of all, uh, the Bible is the word of God, and second of all, science is the coolest, most fun and awesome thing anybody could ever do. <laughs> but it wasn't until well into my academic studies that I started to think about these, how these two different areas of my life could not simply coexist, but interact. And so in the example of climate change, I'll be kind of walking through my own thought processes. Originally, when I began to study climate change, I focused more on the first part of what I'm going to talk about. How do we know climate is changing? How do we know it's humans? And then my own research developed to talk about, well, why do we care about this issue? I started to realize science can't completely answer that question for us. And then furthermore, as I and as my colleagues who study climate began to realize it isn't enough to just say it's real and we care about it. What can we do about it? Well, there the science really isn't very much help at all. Because science, as one of my colleagues has said, science is like a compass. It can tell us which way is north and south, east and west. But the compass doesn't know where we're going. So it can help us. It can inform our decisions. But it can't tell us what's the right thing to do. I'm going to begin, though, by saying something that usually raises a couple of eyebrows. You're probably wondering, why does she have this picture of a window? This is not Houston. Everybody knows that Houston is, is flooding right now. This is not Houston. This is a picture from the UK several years ago. And the reason why I have this picture is because it is a very important place to start. <laughs> I don't believe in global warming. And I'm not just reading the picture. I really honestly don't believe in global warming. Now you may be saying, hang on, am I in the right room? Yeah, there's another one. No, <laughs> you are in the right room. Why not? Because belief in something, faith in something, is first of all not something that we necessarily need to apply to science. And second of all, it immediately sets up a conflict. Because I have faith, I have belief, and it isn't in global warming. As the book of Hebrews said, and this is the verse I was thinking of in the quote that Jessica mentioned earlier, as the book of Hebrews says, faith is what? The substance of things hoped for, so in the future, to come, and the evidence of things that are not seen. Now, if I had been there when the author of Hebrews was writing this some 2,000 years ago, I would have jogged their elbow and I would have said, well, you forgot the best part of the verse, the second half. The second half is clearly this. Science is the substance of things here and now, the evidence of what we can observe, right? That's what science is. If we go to Google, the arbiter of modern society, you know, right, that our brains hold less information now than before Google came along. We are actually making decisions subconsciously to jettison enormous amounts of information because we know we can Google it on our phone. 
what happens if all the phones break? <laughs> so Google tells us science is what? Very similar definition. The systematic study of the physical and natural world through observing and experimenting. Whereas faith, on the other hand, is a strong belief that is based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. So that is why I don't believe in global warming. And I make a point of telling people that because often today, global warming is presented as a belief, specifically as a false religion, one in which we worship the earth and Al Gore is the high priest. You may say, who thinks that? And my answer to you is many people who send me emails. I can show them to you if you don't believe me. So Lindsey Graham is one of our more recent candidates in the GOP primaries. And he said something which I think is very insightful. He said, the problem, speaking about climate change, the problem is that Al Gore has turned this thing into a religion. And of course, if we go to the internet, we find evidence that that is indeed the case. <laughs> not really, not really. <laughs> but as another scientist said, science does not demand belief. Scientists, at least not the ones I hang out with, we do not get together on Sunday to join hands and sing, yes, gravity is real, I will have faith. Whether we believe in gravity or not, and I have no idea whether this horse believed in gravity or not, whether we believe or not, we're going down if we step off the cliff. In the same way with climate change, whether we believe it's happening or not, whether we believe it's humans or not, climate is changing as we will see because that is my first question. But before I get there, I want to propose something that first of all, and this is where I began my own journey. I began my own journey with the awareness and the supposition that faith and science are not in competition. They are not two mutually exclusive belief systems. Now, I know there is scientism. There are people, not that many of them, but there are people who have turned science into a religion. But the way that we as scientists understand science is that it is not a religion, it is not a belief, it is, something that, it is not something that we sing about on Sundays. <laughs> they are two very different things. And what I have realized through the trajectory and the arc of my life over the, over the past 10, 15, 20 years is that it isn't enough to say they're not mutually exclusive when it comes to tough, complicated, thorny issues like climate change, but like many other issues in the world today too, we need both of them to move forward. If we are people of faith, we need to connect what's in our hearts to what's in our heads. For about 80% of the people in the United States, what's in our hearts does have to do with our faith, but for 20% who are not part of any specific denomination or religion, there is still plenty in our hearts, right? There's plenty in our hearts that have to do with our values and what's important to us that we need to connect to our heads to move forward on tough issues. So beginning with question number one, beginning with the science, what can science tell us? Science can answer really important questions like is climate changing? And the most important question that I get between the months of November and April, which is, it's freezing, where's global warming now? In where I live in West Texas, it does snow and it snowed on April Fool's Day this year. So there was plenty of these looks going around. Science can tell us that one cold day, one cold year, one wet season, one dry season, one heat wave, science can tell us that these things are like a single tree. What happens in a certain place at a certain time is weather. But weather is what sticks in our heads, right? We remember that day. I remember the day when I saw a water spout. I remember the day when we had to drive out through snowdrifts four feet tall. I remember the day when it was so hot we had to 
fry an egg on the sidewalk to see if it would work, right? We remember these days. But we're not talking about weather. We are talking about climate, which is like the forest. We're talking about the long-term average of conditions all around Minnesota, all around the United States, all around the world, over climate timescales of 20 to 30 years. But here's the problem. Our human brains are not built to remember the temperature in Minneapolis, St. Paul, every single day of the year for 30 years and then to fit a trend line to it in our heads to figure out if it's going up or down. Maybe one or two people do have that type of brain, but I don't and most of us don't. So what does that mean? It means that we focus disproportionately on our own experiences. And so all the time, every single week, I get somebody saying, it's freezing, global warming can't be real. But what we have to realize is saying something like that is similar to if we were on the Titanic over 100 years ago, if we were on the Titanic when it hit that iceberg and we said this, the ship can't be sinking because my end just went 200 feet up in the air. You see the problem with this, right? Yeah, I gotta look at the whole ship not my end. We have to look at the whole forest, not a single tree. We have to look at the whole record, not just what happened to me in a certain day at a certain time. So when we look at the temperature of the entire planet, science can collect all of the data from thousands of thermometers around the planet. And it can carefully add it up and average it out and account for the fact that we have lots of thermometers here and only a few thermometers over there. We can do this through science. And when we look at global temperature, which is the average temperature of our planet at a height of two meters above the ground, so all the thermometers are the same height all around the world, we see that um, actually it doesn't really look like it's increased much. And in fact, if you turn on the news or you go to your favorite website, you will hear people saying, global warming stopped. We haven't seen an increase in 16, no, 17 years. No, maybe 18 years. But again, what is climate? Climate is the average over what? At least 20 to 30 years. We're not looking at 20 to 30 years here, but when we add those years, we see that one year may be colder, another year may be warmer, but over the long term, it is increasing. 2014 was the warmest year on record. 2015 beat that. And there is an over 99% chance that 2016 will beat that. Here in Minnesota, our summer temperatures have been increasing. This is looking at Minnesota summer temperatures since the 1900s until now. And although winter temperatures are more variable, they have been increasing even faster. Those are winter temperatures here in Minnesota. It isn't just about thermometers and satellite data, though. When we look around the entire world, there are tens of thousands of lines of evidence that our planet is warming. You go up to the Arctic, where over 200 Native American villages in Alaska alone are built on ground that used to be permanently frozen all year round. Now, because the Arctic is warming between two to four times faster than the rest of the planet, that ground is melting and crumbling and their homes are falling into the ocean. You can go down to Australia where a couple of years ago they had a heat wave so severe, this is a map of the temperature in Australia during that heat wave, they had to add a new color to their temperature map. You see that light purple in the middle? That is 54 degrees Celsius. I can tell a few people know Celsius. <laughs> 129 Fahrenheit. <laughs> yeah. And they've had to use the color, I believe, since then. You can go down to the Gulf of Mexico where hurricanes are a part of life. There's always been hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico. What's happening? Those hurricanes are getting stronger because where do they get their energy from? They get it from warm ocean water. And what's happening to the ocean? It's heating up. It's feeding those hurricanes steroids. And then come back up here to Minnesota, and what do we see here in Minnesota? Very large increases in the risk of heavy rainfall and flooding. In some parts of Minnesota, people's homeowner's insurance has doubled and even tripled since the 1990s because the increased flood risk. 
Jessica and I did a study for the city of Chicago several years ago, about 10 years ago now almost, where we looked at the risks that climate change poses for the city of Chicago. And one of the major risks that we identified was increased risk of flooding from heavy rainfall events. Fast forward to just a couple years ago, and farmers insurance sues the city of Chicago and Cook County for failing to adequately prepare for the flood risks associated with the changing climate. How ironic is that? They couldn't say they didn't know because we did the work for them. Yeah. <laughs> but then the, the, the good end to that story is that Farmers Insurance actually end up withdrawing the lawsuit. They said they just, they just filed the lawsuit to make a point because they were picking up the tab, they were getting sick of picking up the tab, and they wanted the city to do something. So when I followed up this past fall, I wanted to know, well, have they done anything? And it just so happens, it turns out that yes, they've built new stormwater system and a new reservoir to hold that extra water. And it's just, both of them have just gone online this past year. So they are making changes. If we look around the entire world, looking at when plants are blooming, when trees are budding, what types of insects or animals or birds we see in the places where we live, how fast the glaciers are melting, how fast the sea level is rising. Around the entire world, there are over 26 and a half thousand natural indicators of a warming climate, many of them in our own backyards. So science can answer this question, is climate changing? Yes, it is. Science can also answer the next question. This is a really important question because we all know that our planet's climate has changed in the past. We all know that things have been different before. But what many people don't realize is that that's what climate scientists study. We study natural cycles. We study the influence of the sun and the volcanoes on climate. That's what we do. So we've been studying these other causes of climate change for decades and, this may surprise you, even centuries. And this is what we found. Let's start with the sun. If the sun were causing our planet to warm, and the sun's energy does go up and down over time, if the sun were causing our planet to warm, would that mean that we were getting more energy from the sun or we were getting less? Stick out your hand and give me a thumbs down or a thumbs up, more or less. There we go. Need to make sure everybody's awake. Yes, you're awake, especially the front row. All right. Here's the temperature of the Earth from year to year is that very faint line, and then the long-term average is the thick line. So you know it goes up and down, but it's increasing over time. Here's the sun's energy. Now, yes, there is an 11-year sunspot cycle. That's that wiggly line there. You see it was discovered by Galileo. That's how long we've known about this, this cycle. But the sun's energy has been going down since the 1970s. So it can't be the sun. It has an alibi. Could it be a natural cycle? Where I live in Texas, we are very impacted by El Nino. We get water, we get rain when we have an El Nino, and we get killer drought when we get a La Nina. So people say, well, couldn't it just be one of these natural cycles inside the Earth's climate system? We have quite a few of those, and again, that's what we study. These natural cycles are like a seesaw or a teeter-totter. Get your hands ready again. Who here calls it a seesaw? Seesaw? OK, teeter-totter? Oh, a lot more teeter-totters. Interesting. So just so you know, there's only one other place in the entire country, as far as I can tell, where the majority are teeter-totterers. <laughs> and you're not going to guess where it is, because it isn't anywhere that touches Minnesota. Utah. In Utah, it's about 90% teeter-totters. <laughs> just so you know. A bit of cultural difference. <laughs> so what does a teeter-totter or a seesaw do? It just goes back and forth, up and down. So what do these natural cycles do? They just move heat around the Earth system, up and down, back and forth. So when we get warmer during an El Nino event, that means the heat's coming from the ocean up into the atmosphere. When we get cooler during a La Nina, the heat's going from the atmosphere down into the ocean, back and forth, up and down. So if our planet were warming, and again, if this is air temperature at two meters above the ground, if it were warming because of a natural cycle, and if we looked at the heat content of the Earth, the heat content of the atmosphere should be going up because it's getting warmer. What should be happening to the heat content of the ocean? Thumbs? 
Excellent. You guys are getting this. So let's look and see if that's the case. Ready? Here we have the green is the heat content, not just of the atmosphere, but the land and the ice too, all together. And what's the blue? The blue is the heat content of the ocean in exajoules. You know how much energy that is? We're talking like Hiroshima bombs worth of energy, not pieces of chocolate cake. Although some people's chocolate cake may be close, especially flourless chocolate cake. Yes, I love it too. The air temperature, if we use air temperature to measure the warming of our planet, it's the tip of the iceberg of global warming. The rest of the iceberg of global warming is literally in the ocean. The ocean is now absorbing 20 times more heat than the land, the atmosphere, and the, ocean, and the sea ice all put together. It can't be a natural cycle because the entire planet is warming. But then you may say, hang on, I saw that movie. Which movie am I talking about? The one with the squirrel chasing the nut. We now know that the last ice age ended because a rodent chased a nut and broke off a piece of ice that triggered the collapse of the entire ice sheet. So that's why we live in Minnesota today, because of that one rodent chasing the nut. No, just kidding about that part. But we do know that there was an ice age. And we do know that during the ice age, most of where we were right now was covered in quite a bit of ice, right? So a natural question is, couldn't it just be the ice age cycles, which are caused by changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun? Well, first of all, we can calculate from first principles using trigonometry and algebra. We can calculate where we are on that cycle. And we know the answer to where we are in the ice age cycle. But we can also look at the data. And when we look at the data, it tells us the same answer. The warming from the last ice age peaked already 8,000 years ago. If we look at the last 6,000 years of the Earth's history, this is what it looked like. Temperature is the red line on the top. What was it doing? It was on a long, slow slide. Into what? Into the next ice age. Yes. The next thing on our geologic calendar is another ice age, or was, I should say. Because, as you can see here, something happened. And now we are headed up so quickly that scientists have concluded, and this is a direct quote from scientific papers, we have indefinitely, whether we like it or not, postponed the next ice age. Now let's just be clear here. Do we want another ice age? Thumbs up, thumbs down. No, we don't, no. Why not? What's the perfect temperature for us? There's an answer to that. The perfect temperature is exactly the temperature that we've had over the development of our civilization. Why are there seven and a half billion people on the planet today? Because we've had the perfect temperature for the last few thousand years. That's why we exist, is because we had the perfect temperature. So, I'm gonna say something a little radical here. Was a little warming a good thing? Yes, I'm gonna give that a thumbs up. Would I want a little warming to prevent us from going into the next ice age? Two thumbs up. Have we had a little warming? Yes. Have we had a lot of warming? Yes. We are heading way into unknown territory. We overshot our mark. And down here, carbon dioxide, this black line, gives us the first clue of where to look for an explanation. But before we go there, let's just wrap up. It can't be the sun causing our planet to warm right now because we'd be getting cooler, not warmer. It can't just be natural cycles inside the Earth system because the whole planet is warming. It isn't just teeter-tottering heat back and forth from one side of the Earth to the other, from the ocean to the atmosphere and back. And it can't be the ice age cycles because the next thing coming was another ice age. How could humans affect something as big as our planet? When we look at our planet from space, we think you can't even see a single piece of evidence of human footprint on this planet. It is beautiful, pristine, untouched. How could we tiny little humans affect something as big as our planet? Well, for a long time we couldn't, but then this happened. World population. Now, again, almost seven and a half billion. So now, a much more accurate way to look at our planet, if you are up there in the International Space Station, 
is not the way it looks during the day. It is the way it looks at night. This is literally a picture. Of course, it's a composite image because we know it's daytime in China when it's, no, no, no. We know that. It's a composite image using Photoshop. <laughs> but it really is the picture from space. And I'm going to zoom in so you can see where we are. Can you spot the Twin Cities? Isn't that crazy? Can you, see, you can see the roads. You can see the roads from here to Chicago. Isn't that amazing? How are we impacting our planet? Through our choices of energy. And this offers the first clue. It isn't just the fact that we have so many lights. You're literally looking at pictures of lights. Cast your eyes now, those of you who are good at geography, cast your eyes up to North Dakota. What major city is that up there in North Dakota? <laughs> it is not the lost city of Atlantis, as far as I know. It is not a city at all. It is the light of thousands of flares from fracking wells. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, which brought many good things, we were talking about this this afternoon with, with a group of students, the Industrial Revolution was a good thing, by and large. In fact, give me your thumbs. By and large, good or bad? Good. What do we enjoy about it? I enjoy wearing decent glasses. I enjoy having electricity and uh, regular flowing water. I realize the Romans had flowing water too, but I don't think as many of us would have had that if we were still back in Roman times. I enjoy the medical advances that came with the Industrial Revolution. I enjoy the quality of life that we have today. Would I go back 300 years? No. When I read those like time travel books where somebody wakes up and they wake up in like Jane Austen times, honestly, it's kind of like a horror film for me. I would not want to live back in those times. But just like a good thing can have unintended side effects, has anybody ever taken a medication that had a side effect? Right? You have, right? I have. When you take a medication, you need it. It does good things for you. It hopefully helps you and even better heals you. But sometimes it has an unintended side effect. In the same way, the Industrial Revolution had an unintended side effect. And that was, by burning coal and gas and oil, we produce a ton of carbon. This is how much carbon we've produced in megatons. When we burn the stuff, it combines with oxygen in the atmosphere to create carbon dioxide. And we have measured carbon dioxide going up, and we have actually, believe it or not, we've measured oxygen going down. Now, the oxygen hasn't gone down enough to worry us. There's still plenty to breathe. Don't get worried about that. But we have measured it, and we know that's what's happening. Why do we care about it? I'm going to show you a little animation. And you can find this on my website if you're looking for it with the voice. The reason we care about carbon dioxide is because our planet already has a natural blanket of carbon dioxide and other heat trapping gases. The sun's energy shines down and goes right through that blanket like a window. The earth heats up, gives off heat energy, and that blanket traps the heat energy just like a blanket traps our body heat at night. This natural blanket keeps our planet almost 60 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it would be otherwise. Our planet would be a frozen ball of ice if it weren't for this natural blanket. Well, if it's natural, then what's the problem? The problem is, is that we are wrapping an extra blanket around our planet, a blanket that it did not need. And just like when I used to stay at my grandma's house, this is my grandma, she would sneak in at night and put an extra blanket on me every single night because she thought I would freeze to death and I would wake up in the middle of the night sweating saying, Grandma, I didn't need the blanket. That is what we are doing to our planet. We're wrapping an extra blanket around it when it already has the perfect natural blanket. That's why carbon dioxide matters. And science can tell us one more thing here. The science that I just told you We've known for this long. These are the real guys. They're not fake old-timey photos of some of our colleagues today. These are the real people. Fourier discovered the natural blanket. Tyndale discovered that mining coal was adding to that natural blanket. Arrhenius, in the 1890s, 
So about almost 120 years ago, in the 1890s, by hand, using nothing but physics that they knew back then, calculated how much the world would warm if we doubled or tripled the blanket on our planet. He calculated how much faster the Arctic would warm than the rest of the world. It took him two years to do the calculations by hand. Somewhere around about Christmas of the second year, his wife packed up the family and left. We use computers today so we can stay married. <laughs> but he was right. And that was in the 1890s. And the last person, whose name actually is Guy, was a British engineer who in 1937 published a paper showing that he had already measured an increase in the temperature of the planet with thermometers. We've known it for a really long time. So you might say, well, then what on earth is going on? Because science can tell us. Science can tell us climate is changing, and science can tell us for the first time in the history of this planet, it really is us. Now, I know that you might have other science related questions. And I love talking about science. But if we got into all the but what about questions, we'd be here for a couple more hours. Some of you may be OK with that, but I'm told they want us out. So we're not doing that. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to refer you to skepticalscience.com. It is a fantastic resource. They even have an iPhone app. And you can find answers to all the questions there. What about those scientists? Wasn't there some email scandal with scientists? Weren't they just fabricating that data? Aren't we just socking away money for our Swiss bank accounts? No. <laughs> How do we know it's humans? Carbon dioxide is just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit in the atmosphere. How could it affect something as big as our planet? Wasn't it warmer in medieval times? Didn't they name Greenland green? You kind of get where I'm going with here. The answer's all there. It's fun. I know a few of you are going to go home, right? You're going to be on this all night. Yes. <laughs> but I'm going to move on and talk about question number three, because this is where the science starts to fade on us. I study the science, and to me, as a scientist, I'm like, well, it matters because it matters. It's important because it's science. But when we're talking about an issue that has enormous implications for our entire planet, there's more to it than that. And part of the issue we have with climate change or with global warming is that if you ask somebody, hey, I just wrote a book about global warming. What should I put on the cover of my book? What do you think you, you would get from 9 out of 10 people? A picture of a, thank you, preferably sitting on a melting iceberg. Exactly. That is the number one image that people associate with climate change. But as Polar Bears International says, I got an opportunity to go to the Arctic with them this past year. And the reason why I went is because this is what they said to me the first time we talked. They said, the reason we care about the polar bear is because the polar bear is telling us what will happen to us next if we don't heed its warning. You can see this polar bear really is trying to communicate. <laughs> and having looked eye to eye with a polar bear at even closer distance to that, I can tell you their eyes are very intelligent scarily so when you realize they could bite off your head and not even notice it. Why do we care about climate change? I'm going to propose a reason that might not have occurred to you yet. This is what our normal climate looks like. We have hot years and cold years. We have wet years and dry. But our society and our infrastructure our energy, our water, our cities, our roads, the size furnace we buy, the type of windows we put in our home, our estimated crop yields, what type of business we go into, it is built on a very simple assumption we hardly ever think about. The assumption that there may be ups and there may be downs, there may be good years and bad, but it all averages out in the end. And guess what? This assumption was a very reasonable assumption for the past hundred and even several thousand years. Yes, there was a medieval warm period, but it was a blip on the radar compared to the changes we have seen this century. And even worse, what if it isn't just that this assumption of stability or stationarity is no longer true? What if the variability is increasing too? 
We're redrawing the 100-year flood zones. We're changing the heat wave risk. I live in Lubbock. This is a picture of Lubbock. It's very flat there. We don't have mountains, but we have inverse mountains. You're driving along, and all of a sudden, a giant canyon opens under your feet. It's literally like an upside-down mountain. An hour and a half north of Lubbock, we have the second biggest canyon in the United States after the Grand Canyon, Palo Duro Canyon. It's really amazing. But for most of where I live, the roads are very straight because the ground is so flat. In fact, there is an interstate highway going north from Lubbock to Plainview that is so straight that you could get a fair way up the road to Plainview, driving along in your car, looking in the rearview mirror. Don't try it, and I don't recommend it. And don't use it as an excuse if you have an accident either. Catherine Hayhoe told me to try it. No. <laughs> but why could you get that far? Because the road is so straight. You could even stay in your lane looking backwards. Just before you get to Plainview, though, there is a giant curve in the road. And not only that, but there is this row of concrete silos on the curve. What happens if we are driving along, looking in our rearview mirror at where we used to be? I hope you know the answer to that. If not, they will be collecting your driver's license at the door before you leave. <laughs> in the same way, planning for the future based on the past works if climate is stable. If there is a curve in the road, though, it doesn't work. We're not going to end up in the place where we wanted to be. And as we just saw, is climate changing? Yes, it is changing. What type of curve am I talking about? Well, for example, if you look around the United States, these are some maps I made for the National Climate Assessment a number of years ago. On average, we don't get very many days over 100 degrees. Where I live in West Texas, we only get about 10 days on average over 100 degrees. But in 2011, we had some summer. We had a summer where we had almost 50 days over 100 degrees, and you do not want to see my air conditioning bill. After one month, we fled for Canada. We just literally could not afford to pay the bill. And I'm not somebody who likes it in the 60s. I'm very comfortable well into the 70s. 2011, though, looked eerily reminiscent of this figure that I had made two years before showing the average summer in just a couple of decades if we continue on our current pathway. And... If we continue on our current pathway through the end of the century, it looks even worse, days over 100 degrees. You can see Minnesota there, right? Zooming in with more national climate assessment maps, this is showing the projected changes in average temperature, top left, days above 95 degrees, top right. The length of the frost-free season is going to be changing by weeks, not days which is good news for gardeners and for farmers, but not so great news about pests and invasive species. And the cooling degree days are changing, which means what? Your air conditioning bills will look like mine pretty soon. What else does it mean for Minnesota? Well, there's relationships between things like crop yields, corn and soybean, and temperature. It isn't just about temperature, though. It's also about other things like heavy rainfall. What's the science connecting a warmer planet to heavy rainfall? It's pretty simple. It happened in Houston, and it's happening here. In a warmer planet, more water evaporates from lakes and oceans and rivers and streams. Along comes a storm, as it usually does, especially this time of year in Texas. We get storms now. That's natural. Along comes the storm, and there's a lot more water vapor sitting up there for that storm to pick up and dump on us. What happens when that does? This happens. This is our university. That's the football stadium. This is a six-lane highway. Those are the undergraduates floating away. <laughs> but it matters to drought, too. Here's the irony of a warmer planet. This is, say, what our rainfall looks like, OK? So we know it's getting stretched up because there's more water vapor sitting up there to be picked up and dumped on us. But did you know it's being stretched down as well? Because when a natural drought comes along, as it frequently does in Texas, it's warmer than it would have been 50 or 100 years ago, so water evaporates more quickly from the soils and from the reservoirs, and the drought intensifies and lasts longer. Sure, there's more moisture up here, but if a storm system doesn't come along, it's not going to get picked up and dumped. It's just going to get transported out of the region. 
And that's what we've seen happening. It isn't just about temperature and rainfall and flooding and drought. There are many other ways that it can affect us economically in our wallets and is already doing so today. This is a report called Risky Business by Michael Bloomberg, who is a conservative businessman, formerly the mayor of New York. And then just the other day, last week, the Harvard Business Review, not a magazine of Greenpeace. The Harvard Business Review published this headline, the data says climate change could cost investors trillions of dollars. Why do we care about a changing climate? Because in nine times out of 10, it is taking a risk we already face today, flooding in Minnesota, drought in Texas, hurricanes in Miami. It is taking a risk we already face today and it is exacerbating it. It's not bringing hordes of hungry polar bears here. Once in a while, it brings a new disease spread by mosquitoes changing their range, but nine times out of 10, it's just taking something that we're already familiar with and it's just giving it steroids. So why do we care? The science tells us that climate change is gonna affect us. Our quality of life, our resources, our economy, our family, our health, our community. But there's a bit more to it. This is where I started to make my connections with my faith. And one of the first connections I made, helped by a fellow scientist called Cal DeWitt from Madison, who wrote a book called Earthwise over 30 years ago, one of the first connections I made was with the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, it says something that almost every child learns in Sunday school, that humans were created in God's image. But in no Sunday school I was ever in did they finish the rest of the chapter. Did you know that there is a reason for this in the Bible? There's a reason it says that humans were created in God's image so that we could fill in the blank in your mind there for a second. We were creating God's image so we could what? So we could be responsible for every living thing on the face of the earth. This has led to the idea of creation care. If we are given responsibility, or even dominion, if you want to use the King James Bible, dominion over the planet, imagine if we had dominion over a farm, and we extracted every last resource and penny from that farm, and we left that farm broken, destitute, and in ruins. What does that say about us, about our attitudes towards the person who gifted us with the farm, towards the CEO of a company who sucks everything out of the company and just leaves it in the dust? We wouldn't respect a person like that. We respect a person who, when they are given a tremendous gift, a land, a business, a planet, invest in it, take care of it, want it to grow and profit. From that, we came up with the idea of creation care, an idea that dates all the way back to the writings of John Calvin in the 1600s. The idea that people have responsibility not to lord it over the planet, kind of in a pyramid scheme with humans on the top, but to be part of and embedded into creation. Because we cannot live apart from this world. What would happen if all life disappeared from this planet except for us? What would happen if the entire planet evaporated under our feet and we were floating through space? I know these are extreme examples, but this makes the point. We are not separate from nature. We are living creatures embedded in this nature. But there's more to it than that. I grew up, when I was nine years old, we moved to Colombia in South America. And I know that people there live very differently. If you look at where our carbon emissions have come from over the past hundred years, on an annual basis, China did catch up with the United States a few years ago. On a per person basis, they're nowhere near. And on a looking at the last hundred years basis, they have a long way to go. Now, Alaska gets a bit of a bad rep here. Alaska's not personally responsible, just by association. <laughs> so I want you to fix this map in your head because I'm about to show you a second map that looks almost exactly the same, except instead of saying, where do the carbon emissions come from? The second map says, who is most vulnerable? Ready? Fix this map in your head. What do you see? Pretty much the opposite, isn't it? If we look at areas at risk from sea level rise, this century 
we could lose the Florida Keys, half the Everglades, and large parts of Miami. But in Bangladesh, they could lose the land where 18 million people live and they grow half their rice. We stand to lose Glacier National Park. It started off with over 100 glaciers and there's less than 30 left. Many of my colleagues have been going to Glacier National Park in their vacations. And when I ask them when, they say, why? They say in all seriousness to see the glaciers before they're gone. But over a billion people around the world depend on glaciers for their water. This is the city of Lima, Peru. It's depended on this glacier since the time of the Incas. In 1978, that's what the glacier looked like. In 2004, that's what it looked like. And eventually the water ran out and they had to build a desalinization plant, but it's a lot more expensive to desalinize, desalinize water than to get free water from a glacier. What happens when we get a heat wave in Texas? I complain about my electricity bill and farmers lose their crops. What happens when we get a heat wave in India? As we did last summer, people die. What happens when we get a flood here? Terrible damages, huge economic payouts, insurance claims. What happens when it floods in Pakistan? Over the last few years, they've lost 3,000 lives and $16 billion, most of it not insured due to floods. What happens when a hurricane hits the coast of the United States? Tremendous damages. People are still paying off payments from Sandy. But what happens when it hits islands in the South Pacific? People die in the droves from water contamination and the spread of disease, not just from the direct impacts. Around the world, people are already having to leave the places where they live. This is the town of Newtok, Alaska. It's one of the places where the ground was melting the quickest and they have already had to leave. This is a little island in Louisiana where Native Americans who live there, the Biloxi Chitimacha Choctaw tribe, I'm impressed I got that out without tripping, they have to leave too. They've lived there for centuries. But because the land is sinking as we withdraw more water and oil from underneath it, and the oceans are rising because warmer water takes up more space, their land is going under, and they're not the only ones. There's islands around the world, Tuvalu, for example, where people are trying to move. New Zealand is taking 75 people a year, but that's not enough to get everybody there before the island's underwater. So it isn't just a case of, you know, caring for creation and planting and tending the garden. It's a case of, as they say in Texas, we have a lot of road signs in Texas from God. Why are you laughing? <laughs> As this road sign says, it's a case of loving others. And so when I look to the Bible, there is one word that runs throughout the entire Bible. It is not stewardship. It is not moral responsibility. Those are all very good things, and they are there. The word that runs through the entire Bible is the word love. The fact that we are to love others in the same way we have been loved by God, and that this is how we are to be recognized. Who gets this? I'll tell you who gets this. The Pope gets this. He wrote an encyclical last summer about how caring about climate change is caring for the poor and our common home. The National Association of Evangelicals, led by Leith Anderson, a pastor from here, from Minneapolis, published this three years before the Pope. So there. National Association of Evangelicals in the United States beat the Pope to it. They published, loving the least of these, how caring about creation is caring for the poor. So why do I personally care about climate change? Yes, I worry about the places where I grow up. I see the places I lived in Ontario, in Muskoka, in Canada changing as a result of a changing climate. But because I also know how close so many people live to the edge, I care about it because it disproportionately increases the risks facing the poor of this world, those already suffering from poverty, hunger, disease. And that isn't fair. So why do I care? My faith says I care too, because climate change is impacting not just me, but my neighbor as well. You can see how the two silos are starting to merge. But then we get to the last question. And that is the question of what can we do about it? Science can tell us one thing here that is helpful, and this is the science I do. Science can tell us that depending on the choices we make, 
If we continue to depend on fossil fuels that produce carbon, or if we can transition in a sensible, sustainable way to other ways of getting energy that don't produce carbon, depending on the choices we make, we will see a very, very different impact on our world. And just for reference, we've warmed by one and a half degrees so far. You get the picture. But this is where the science stops. Because the science can't tell us what's the right choice. Now, you may read articles in Scientific American saying X amount of fossil fuels have to stay in the ground, and people are willing to put a number on that. Or Y amount of carbon dioxide can stay in the atmosphere, but not a single bit more. They're willing to put a number on it. But putting a number on the exact amount of carbon we can or can't burn is like putting a number on the exact amount of cigarettes you can smoke before you get lung cancer. I would venture to say that if we knew an exact number, if we could smoke 999 cigarettes and there would be guaranteed no risk of lung cancer unless you smoke that extra one, personally, I would have smoked the 999. Why didn't I? Because we know that the more you smoke, the greater the risk. Is there a magic number? No. If you've already been smoking for 20 years or 300 years, as we have as a society in terms of fossil fuels, if we've already been smoking for 300 years, When's the right time to stop? As soon as possible, right? If we keep on smoking, the more we smoke, the greater the risks. But science can't tell us what's the right choice. We look to the decisions we have to make. And this is a quote from the president's science advisor, a colleague of ours called John Holder. And he said, at this point, we have three choices. We can reduce our carbon emissions. We can prepare for a very different future. Or, this is not a science word, we can suffer. The question is what the mix is going to be. Science doesn't know a lot about suffering, but people of faith know a lot about suffering. We know a lot about helping people who are suffering. But that's why it's so depressing that when you ask people, how concerned are you about climate change? And you divide out their answer by religious affiliation. Who is the most concerned people group in the entire United States about climate change? Hispanic Catholics. Who is the least concerned people group in the entire United States? Can you read that? White Catholics. Isn't that interesting? You might say, and then white evangelicals, just to point out, are slightly above, and then white mainline Protestants are just a little bit above, then you have Jewish, then you have non-Christian religions, so nobody's really off the hook here. So this difference between Catholics, though, again, is very revealing. Remember that figure I showed you of our temperature and our carbon dioxide slowly, slowly, slowly going down, then all of a sudden going up, and that was a clue to what's going on? This figure is a clue to what's going on. Because last I checked, white Catholics and Hispanic Catholics had the same pope. Is that correct? Yes. So if they have the same pope, what the heck is going on? Well, to quote another of my colleagues, Galen Carey, who is the vice president of the National Association of Evangelicals, Galen said something very insightful. He gets the answer because he has been around the block on this one. It is true that many white Catholics and white evangelicals oppose actions to slow climate change, but it is not on a religious basis. Why? It is a, on a political basis because they believe the government wants to take away their freedom. Scientific uncertainty and religious arguments are used as a smokescreen in this country to deny the real reason that we have people objecting to the science of climate change, which is we are afraid of the solutions that have been proposed, because most of the solutions have to do with big government. And one of the biggest chasms right now is the chasm between big and small government people, right? I gave a talk to water managers a year ago down in South Texas, and I knew that you know they probably weren't that on board with the whole idea of climate change, but we talked about water first. And then we talked about trends in water. Then we talked about trends in rainfall. Then we talked about changes in variability. Then we talked about future trends. Then we talked about water conservation. And at the end, an older man at the back got up and he said, you know, I wasn't really on board with this whole thing, but it makes sense. I have one problem. I don't want the government 
to tell me how to set my thermostat. And I said, you know what? I don't either. But that is often the only types of solutions that are presented. Solutions that involve government legislation, government restrictions, loss of personal liberties, taxes. Students of history. What major event in America's past had to do with taxes, government restrictions on personal liberties? Anybody here? Anybody know? Maybe this one? The American Revolution? So why are we surprised when a horror and fear of these very topics are burned into the psyche of Americans? I can say that because I'm not. (laughs) Nothing more fun than psychoanalyzing a different person's culture. (laughs) So that is why we're in the difficult situation we are today. But I'm going to end by proposing one more perhaps unusual and surprising thought to you. And this is it. Even if we can't agree about the politics, and as long as there's three of us on this world, we never will. And even if we can't agree about the science, many of us could potentially agree about the solutions. And that's what really matters. What type of solutions can we agree on? Well, in Texas, five years ago, Only about three or four out of every 10 people would say climate is changing. Now in Texas, about seven or eight out of 10 would say it's changing. Why? Because we've seen it with our own eyes. Whether we live in Texas or whether we live in Bangladesh, we see things changing. And we see it right here in Minnesota too. What else might we agree on? The benefits of preparing for a changing climate. Whether it's in the Netherlands where they're building floating villages so that as sea level rises, they just let out a few more feet of anchor chain. Or whether it's Texas where we're developing brand new ways to irrigate our crops that don't waste all of that water by spraying it through the air. What else might we agree on? The benefits of the clean energy economy. Whether it is putting a solar panel on a thatched roof hut in Africa that never had electricity to begin with or whether it's where I live in Texas, where old oil wells are being replaced by shiny white wind turbines. A couple of years ago, I had an opportunity to meet with a farmer south of Lubbock. You could tell he was a little doubtful about this whole science-y thingy. But I was from Texas Tech, and after, after we had lunch, we figured out that he knew somebody who went to my church, and I knew somebody who went to his church. So, you know, we kind of loosened up, warmed to each other, bonded. After about an hour, I felt I was able to ask him a question I'd been wondering about. I said, do you mind if I ask? I noticed that your your neighbor has wind turbines up to the edge of your property line. And you have a few oil wells on your property, but you have no wind turbines. Is there a reason why? And I expected him to say something like, oh, you know, those wind turbines, who want, you know, that type of thing. Well, he said, he said, yes, there is a reason. I said, well, what is it? He said, I put my name on the list after my neighbor, and I've been waiting two years for my wind turbines. I said, oh, you want wind turbines? And he said, of course I want wind turbines. The check arrives in the mail. He said, it's the same amount of money as from the oil wells, but those oil guys are driving in and off my land all the time to collect the oil. They rip up my roads. They get in the way of the farming equipment. The wind turbines, they set them up and they disappear back to Florida. Of course I want wind turbines, who wouldn't? And we're seeing this throughout Texas. Did you know that in Texas, Fort Hood, which is the largest army installation in the country, Fort Hood just went 100% wind and solar because it was the cheapest contract they got. DOD, yes. Did you know that every spring and fall we're breaking record after record? Up to 40% of our electricity can come from wind on a windy week. That's crazy in Texas. There's a little town called Georgetown just north of Austin. It's not a liberal town. Austin's one thing and then there's everybody else. (laughs) If you don't believe me, come visit. Georgetown this year made news by going all green. And there's a cute little video on Facebook you can watch. Why did they do it? They were at great pains to say it wasn't because they wanted to be all environmental. It was just the best business decision. What's wrong with that? Absolutely nothing. It's fantastic. Thumbs up? Yes. Two thumbs up. Now, the 100-pound grill in the room, of course, is this, right? Because we all know what China looks like. 
even if we've never been there, we know it's covered in smog. Now, not all of it's covered in smog, but Beijing is very difficult to breathe in because of all the coal they burn. Now, do we want to be exactly like China? No, we don't. But for a long time, the favorite argument I've heard, when it all comes down to it, push comes to shove, the favorite argument is, why should we do anything about climate change? Because we could do everything we could, but China is building a new coal-powered plant every day, and they'll wreck it all anyways. And we'll just put ourselves at a disadvantage economically. Well, guess what? Today, you can't say that anymore. Because China is the global leader in wind energy. They are the global leader in solar energy. They have more cumulative wind production than the entire rest of the world put together. They have started to cut their coal emissions. They're actually started to inch their way down. They're not going up anymore. And they have a plan in place to actually cap and trade carbon. So rather than saying, you know, what if we do everything and they do nothing, it's more a case of, oh my goodness, they're like way ahead in the clean energy economy and we are scrambling to play catch up with them. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> so what does our faith have to do with this? Well, when we hear people arguing over the issue of climate change, when we hear people saying, we can't fix it because it would ruin the economy, we can't put wind turbines up because they're taking over our way of life. We can't fix it because it's too late. We're all going to hell in a handbasket anyways. No matter what side of the spectrum we're from, we hear these fear-based arguments. Or sometimes we hear anger, which is often a cover for fear. Well, here's where my faith comes into it too. And I'm going to share with you my favorite Bible verse. It is not a verse that has to do with nature or creation with birds or the atmosphere or the universe. It's not a verse that's underlined in green in the Green Bible. There is a Green Bible. It exists. It is a verse that gives us a litmus test for arguments and attitudes on climate change. And it starts off by saying, if it's fear, it's not from God. What is from God? A spirit of power to get stuff done, the ability to act not be paralyzed by fear, but to be acting, the ability to love others and act out of that love, and then lastly, as a scientist, my absolute favorite one, the gift of a sound mind, to make good decisions informed by the science, but coming from a heart of love for our community, our family, and our brothers and sisters, not just here, but on the other side of the world, who have much less than we do. <laughs> Almost done. So what can we do about this? What are hopeful ways to move forward instead of moving forward in fear or despair or anxiety? There is no one perfect thing for everybody to do. I know that's kind of disappointing. But there are some suggestions, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the conversation by planting a few seeds of suggestions. Here is my first seed. Go online and find a carbon calculator and calculate your family's carbon footprint. I promise you it's painless, but I promise you you might be surprised by where it's coming from. It might not be coming from the things you think it's coming from. How do we know how to reduce if we don't even know where it's coming from? Well, say you've done this and you say, okay, I want to act, but what do I do? Another one of my favorite organizations is called Climate Caretakers. It is an organization that every month sends you an idea of something you can do. And then it tracks our collective actions together to show the power of acting in unison. If every home in the United States, every home, not every person, if every home replaced one light bulb, an old incandescent with a new LED that cost a few dollars at Walmart. We would save $30 in electricity costs over the lifetime of the bulb. We would change the bulb much less because LEDs last for years and sometimes even over a decade. Who doesn't want to not change bulbs? And that action, cumulatively, would be like taking almost a million cars off the road. That's the power of acting together. We can encourage our communities to join whether it's churches like the one here in Minnesota that offered its roof 
to its neighbors as a solar garden. Or whether it's like Little Houghton College in upstate New York with 1,200 students, a Wesleyan evangelical college that just installed this past year the biggest solar array of any educational institution in New York State. That's pretty impressive. Whether it's working in our, in our faith communities, it is Faith and Climate Action Week this week, and Interfaith Power and Light, some of whom are here today, Interfaith Power and Light has an organization in each state around the country. If you go to their website, they have statements from every denomination and major faith tradition about climate change from our own leaders. They have resources for sermons, discussion questions, books and videos. They have stuff we can use to talk about this. And then the last thing we can do is we can make our voices heard. And that's why one of the organizations I serve with is Citizens Climate Lobby. And at the end, there's going to be somebody right up here with a clipboard for Citizens Climate Lobby where you can sign up if you're interested. And what I like is that Citizens Climate Lobby connects us with our elected officials. I don't know about you, but I don't know really how to connect with my elected official. Now, I can't really actually vote for him, but he is still my representative because I pay taxes in my district. Citizens Climate Lobby does stuff like this. They have a website where you go, you enter your zip code, you push the button. It gives you the phone number, who to call, and it gives you a script of what to read. Now, you can say whatever you want, but how easy is that? You phone the number, you call and talk to the person, and they say, oh my goodness, one person called and said this. That must mean that 500 people are thinking this. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? So that's why we can do things together, but we need our science to inform our sound mind. We need what's in our hearts. And again, for all of us, it may not be our faith, but for me, it is my faith that is in my heart that informs my values. And my faith tells me that the only thing that counts is when I express that faith through love. So to conclude, in the words of one of my favorite scientists, Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall studied chimpanzees. When I was a little girl, I watched her movies, and this is what she looked like back then. But this is what she just said last year. It is only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony that we as humans can achieve our full potential. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, for that lecture. We're going to have time uh, now to take questions. Again, we've got note cards for you to write your question down on. Um, I think Matt and Martha are going to be coming down through the rows. So just raise your hand if you don't have a no note card and you'd, you'd like to get one of those from mm -hmm. them. Um, do hold those note cards up so they can collect them, and they'll be passing them around. And again, you can also uh, tweet your question online at uh -huh. hashtag Anderson16. That's and I'm actually going to start out with one of the Twitter okay. questions. Okay, and just yeah. a second, actually. Yeah. I'm going to say also, if you're interested in more, on my Facebook page this week for Faith and Climate Action Week, I've been featuring one of my favorite people or organizations each day. So if you're interested, check out my Facebook page, just my name. And I've gone through scientists, faith leaders, ordinary people who are doing amazing things that inspire me. So... Check that out. Thank you. Twitter question. All right, so the first Twitter question um, comes from Nathan. Um, so Catherine, you'd mentioned that we, we've known a lot about how climate works and that climate is changing for a long time. Nathan wants to know what prompted the recent public visibility of climate change, considering that climate scientists have known about it for a century. Yes. So in October this year, I attended an anniversary event. It was an anniversary of the first time that US scientists formally got together and warned a sitting president of the dangers of climate change. Any guesses what anniversary that was? 50, thank you. It was the 50th anniversary. Why are things more urgent now? Because we've been beating the gong, we've been warning, beating the drum, so to speak, for years and even decades now. And we haven't slowed down yet although we're starting to with all of the solar and wind that we're putting in. Why did it become so contentious? Because all of a sudden people realized, oh my goodness, if we don't oppose it, people are actually going to act on it. And when action became a reality, that is when the opposition began. 
Um, Catherine, you talked about, yeah, I think you made a very compelling case for Christians um, caring about climate change because they need to care about the least of these, the people um, with sort of with the, with the most need around the world. Um, there was another Twitter question from Dan that wanted to know, how can, how can Ethiopia raise its standard of living without fossil fuels? Uh, they currently use one three hundredth of the energy of Americans, according to the World Bank. So this question of how do we, um, how do we balance the need to sort of, uh, you know, bring up people's standard of living while doing so in a sustainable way? Yes, that is an excellent question because among many Christian organizations, one of the most compelling arguments I think we often hear is, well, sure, you're saying we need to stop using so much fossil fuels, but what about developing countries? Energy poverty is real. There's about a billion people on this planet today who do not have electricity. What can electricity help with? Preserving food? Preventing illnesses? Treating water? Preserving medicines? Energy poverty is real, and one of the biggest ways we can help increase people's standard of living is through providing energy, electricity, transportation. So isn't it selfish? So the argument goes, isn't it selfish of us to say, oh, well, we used all the fossil fuels that we wanted to for 300 years, but now you can't use any because we're all stopping. That doesn't sound very nice, does it? Here's what that argument leaves out. And you'll think that Dan seeded this question, but he didn't. I just happened to have this picture to show you. I wondered when I heard that to myself, growing up in South America, where you don't see oil wells anywhere except Venezuela. I wondered to myself, how much fossil fuels does Africa and Southeast Asia have where most of our billions live? And this is what we get. Remaining coal, oil, and gas in the world. 37% is in North America. 20% is in Europe. 20% is in the Middle East. Latin America, mostly Venezuela and Brazil, has 14%. How much does Africa and Southeast Asia, including China, have? 9%. They don't have the fossil fuels to raise them up to our standard of living. And saying that they have to do it using fossil fuels is like saying you have to get transportation by, first of all, having the horse-drawn carriage. Then you can go to the Model T Ford. Then we'll allow you to gradually step through time. I mean, how patronizing is that? How colonialistic is that to say you have to do it the way we did it? If you've been to any other part of the world, you know that they have cell phones, not party line telephones, that you can put a solar panel on a thatched roof house without building a coal plant. Yes, people need energy, but what this shows us is they are not gonna get it from fossil fuels because they don't have it. If they build coal-fired power plants, what are they going to be doing? They're going to be in our debt for decades. That is not the loving thing to do. The loving thing to do is to help people, to provide for their needs, to provide for food, water, health care, disease prevention, and energy, energy that will not run out on them, that they can grow right in the places where we live. Thank you. Catherine, you mentioned that um, a lot of people feel very resistant um, towards the science because they're scared of big government solutions. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk about some small government solutions that have been proposed? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So right now, with hardly any government solutions at all, the clean energy economy is taking off. And it really is an issue of time. If we were back in about 1980 right now, in terms of the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, the amount of warming in the ocean, the amount of acidification in the ocean, which we haven't even talked about, but the ocean is becoming both warmer and more acidic as all the carbon dioxide goes into it after it's in the atmosphere. If we were back in 1980 and we had the same amount of incredible growth in the solar and wind industry, if we had the same amount of banks and businesses issuing reports about the economic damages of climate change and the economic benefits of acting. If it were back in 1980 in China, we're building vast wind farms like they are today, we'd actually be in a pretty good state back then because we would still have the time. But we've spent 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, even 100 years doing nothing. 
And so the problem right now is not that we aren't doing the right things because we are, and it's not that the right things won't happen because they will. The problem we have right now is they will not happen fast enough. So there are many ways to address this issue, ways that involve government making choices of who to invest in or not invest in, the government setting limits on this industry or that industry. I'm not an economist. I'm not a policy expert. When it comes to solutions, I know about as much as the average person who's educated on it, no more. But for me, what I really like are solutions that empower the free market to act. And these are solutions that Bob Inglis, for example, talks about, a former Republican congressman. And these are the solutions that Citizens Climate, Lo Climate Lobby talks about, too. The solution of putting a price on carbon so that we can actually make the real decisions. We already have a price on carbon. We're already paying it in terms of the damages that it's causing, but not in a way that we can make any decisions. It's not transparent. Put a transparent price on carbon, refund that money to individuals through their taxes. Catherine, what are you thinking that's a fairy tale? No, in British Columbia, they've had it since 2007. The economy is flourishing. Personal tax rates have dropped to the lowest in Canada. For anybody who's ever paid taxes in Canada, it's a big deal. Corporate tax rates are some of the lowest in all of North America, in British Columbia. Why? Because they put a price on carbon. So there are things we can do that don't involve micromanagement, that do not involve the government telling us how to set our thermostat and what car we are or aren't allowed to drive. Which one is the best one? That should be argued. There should be tons of argument over that. But whether a thermometer is telling you a different number based on whether you are Democrat or Republican, that should not be a topic of argument. Um, can I ask a science question? I know you've directed us to skeptical science to answer. Yes, sort of, okay. you can ask science questions. All right. Um, so one of the things that I hear quite a bit is, is objections to climate models or climate mm -hmm. modeling. Um, and this question sort of fits in with that. It says, uh, you talked about climate projections. Even the IPPC, IPCC said in 2007 that predicting temperature in the future is impossible. All the computer predicting programs from the 1990s have proven flawed. Could you talk okay. about how climate modeling works and, yes. and have, have it, has it given us accurate predictions for Great where we question. are? Great yeah. question. Can science predict the future? Can climate models predict future climate? No, they cannot. That statement is perfectly correct. Can climate models project what the future will be like based on the choices we make? Yes. What is the difference? A weather prediction gives us a percentage certainty based on the physics of the weather, 20% chance of rain, right? Likely to be 95 degrees or 40 degrees. That's a prediction. Can we affect the weather? No. What it's going to be in three days, it will be in three days whether I carry an umbrella or not, although some people may disagree. You know, if you carry an umbrella, it won't rain. <laughs> but climate models aren't trying to predict weather. You can't pick what day to get married four years from now based on what a climate model tells you. Climate models can project long-term changes in averages using physics, not statistics, that's been around for decades and even centuries, not a couple of years, based on the choices we make. Can we affect what happens in the future on climate timescales? Yes. That is why we can't predict it, because if you could predict human behavior, why are you sitting here? You'd be making bazillions of dollars on the stock market. Have the models been wrong? Well, guess what? I actually have a plot. Here we go. Here is the black line, observed temperature from the 1900s. In the green is what the climate models show the temperature of a planet would be with volcanic eruptions, those are the dips, volcanic eruptions, solar cycles, natural cycles, changes in the Earth's orbit, that's the green. You take the exact same climate model, and we have 42 of them today all around the world, and you put in one thing different, humans, specifically human emissions of heat trapping gases, and you get the blue. There is no overestimate. There are some plots on the internet that have been adjusted. And when you actually take the data, which I do, and plot the data yourself, this is what you get. 
But you may say, but aren't you scientists still biased? In fact, I had uh, my program director came to me last year, a man who supports my work. I get along with him great. And he said, Catherine, can I share something with you? I said, sure. He said, could you just tell your colleagues to not be so alarmist? Because people would take you more seriously if you weren't always crying wolf. I said, well, as a matter of fact, being a scientist, scientists have looked at that question. Three years ago, a team of scientists published a paper where they looked at all of the climate projections, not predictions, but projections, made over the 1990s and 2000s. So that was 20 years of projections. Now that's just on the edge of what we call climate. Of course, climate's the long-term average over at least 20 to 30 years. But they looked at 20 years of projections. What are you going to find if you look at projections of how fast Greenland is melting, how fast mountain glaciers are melting, how fast sea level rise is rising, how fast temperature average and extremes are changing, how heavy rainfall is changing? They looked at thousands of scientific studies looking at changes around the world. When you look at those thousands of studies and you look at 20 years of real records and you compare them, if scientists are exaggerating their results, what are we going to find? The average of the papers, thousands of papers, will be higher than what really happened. What did the scientists hypothesize going in? They hypothesized that the average would be about the same as reality. Some would be higher, some would be lower, but they, they estimated that we'd be unbiased. Guess what they found? Neither. They found that science projections are systematically biased. They are biased in the direction of being too conservative. And they concluded that there's no way you can explain this scientifically. They actually coined a new syndrome called ESLD, erring on the side of least drama. They said that scientists are subject to this syndrome where we so hate being called alarmist, and I know what it feels like because I'm called one every day, we so hate being called alarmist that we subconsciously downweight our projections. But guess what? I am called an alarmist by simply standing here and saying climate is changing and humans are responsible. Without putting any numbers on it, I'm immediately alarmist. So at that point, what do you have to lose? So that was an awesome question because the answer is, are the models perfect? No. Part of my job is finding the flaws in the models. Do they get the big picture? Yes. They've been getting the big picture since 1890. Do they overestimate observed change? No. When we look at regional details, they systematically underestimate observed change. Models are not perfect, but they are a tool we can use not to predict the future. Nobody can do that. But they can be used to project the impact of our decisions on our world. Thank you. This person um, noticed that you used mostly faith-based climate active groups in your illustrations. Mm -hmm. And the question is, do you, do you think people of the Christian faith are doing more or less on average than hmm. sort of the rest of the population, just based on... Yeah. Being, being someone that talks to these groups all the time? That's a great question. And there are many other groups. Please do not take what I did as an example of you know, comprehensive groups that are working across the spectrum. I was specifically trying to focus on faith-based groups and even more so on Christian groups because that is a way that those of us of that faith can connect what's in our heads with what's in our hearts. There are many other fantastic organizations out there, many of whom I work with. Are Christians doing more? Um, well, if you go back to here, you know the figure I'm going to go back to, right? All those colors. There we go. I would say the answer is, it depends. <laughs> is it changing? I would say yes. I've been working in this interface for not that long. Only since my husband and I wrote a book together in 2009 did I really start to connect publicly. Up until then, I don't think anybody knew where I went to church on a Sunday, and I didn't know where most of my colleagues went to church on Sunday, because that doesn't matter when you're a scientist. Like I said, the thermometer tells you the same number no matter who you vote for, but it also tells you, tells you the same number no matter what you believe or don't believe in. So it isn't really a topic of conversation around the water cooler. But what I have seen since I started to connect with faith communities is that the momentum is growing and it is building, and it is increasing, and new voices are coming out, and new organizations are being formed. So I don't know that I could say that it's more now, but is the momentum there? Yes, it is, and that is so encouraging. I want to wrap up with um, maybe a follow-up question on that, and about this, this younger generation. Um, Tim from Twitter 
or on Twitter wants to ask, um, what's the best way that we can teach young people, and specifically sort of w once they get to the age of confirmation, um, what's the best way that we can teach young Christians about mm -hmm. climate change? Hmm. I think by connecting it with our core values, by saying, hey, if I'm a Christian, I believe that God created this amazing world that we live in. I believe that it was given to us as a responsibility. So we're not usurping God's authority. We're failing to live up to our own responsibility if we don't care for it. And I believe that we are to be characterized by our love for others. And these are very basic Christian doctrines that are so basic that reading the Pope's encyclical, it actually had an impact. The Pope's encyclical, which came out in June, it had an impact, a measurable impact on Christians in the United States, including even evangelical Christians. There's a measurable Pope effect. As a group, our opinions changed as a result of what the Pope said. Now, I grew up in a family, full disclosure, where my great-great-grandparents were Irish, and they had to leave Ireland because one was Catholic and one was Protestant. So I grew up in a family where the Pope was referred to as, and I'm sorry if this is offensive, as old Red Sox. And it is not something I endorse or support at all, but just that is to say, I grew up in a culture where, you know, Catholic was like not even hardly considered Christian at that time for the background that I came from. But what I've learned the most about and what I feel like is most humbling is recognizing that not just across different Protestant denominations, not just across the Christian faith, which also includes Orthodox and Coptic, but across the landscape of global religions, we see the same sense of care for creation or stewardship, the same sense of moral responsibility or caretaking, and the same sense of loving and caring for people who are vulnerable. And so just last night, I was honored to be able to write a blog piece for the American Geophysical Union, which represents tens of thousands of earth scientists around the Americas. They asked me to find other voices and each of us answer the question as a scientist and as a person of faith, why do I care about climate change? So I found a colleague who's Muslim, a colleague who is Hindu, another colleague who is Jesuit, and then myself. We each wrote our pieces individually, we put them together and guess what happened? They all had the exact same themes in them. Was it coordination? No. Was it an accident? No, it wasn't either. It's because as humans, no matter where or what we believe or do not believe, we have a sense of care, a sense of responsibility for the place where we live, for the world that we live in. I really do believe that if we are a human, I won't ask for thumbs up or thumbs down that one. If we are a human and we live on this planet, we have every reason in the world to care about climate change and to care about our fellow humans also. That is all we need is to be human. Would you please join me in thanking Catherine for the lecture and discussion.